Hello everyone, my name is Jenny Bolivar Medina. I'm an assistant professor and information and technology transfer extensionist, member of the Tree Fruit Extension Team at the Washington State University. Today I'm your host for the webinar title, The Role of Dendrometers for Irrigation Management in Apple. Today we will learn about it, what is the dendrometer, the types of dendrometers, what is the data that we can get from this technology and how we can use this technology for the management of the tree fruit crops. For that, we have the following invited speakers. Our first invited speaker is Dr. Giverson Mupampi. He is an extension assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Cranberry Station, East Wareham, Massachusetts, United States. His position, is focused on conducting original research on integrated approaches to cranberry production and transferring research-based information to the Massachusetts cranberry industry. Currently, his work is focused on improving fruit quality through the use of plant growth regulators and investigating the effect of agrophotovoltaic on canopy microclimate, photosynthetic capacity, fruit quality, and yield. Previously, he gained experience studying tree fruit physiology, and he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Washington State University Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center. Our second speaker is Dr. Lee Kalsest. He is an associate professor of tree fruit physiology in the Department of Horticulture at Washington State University Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center in Wenatchee, Washington. His research program works towards understanding the interactions between environment, horticulture management, and genetics of the tree fruit. Currently, his work is focused on understanding the mechanisms contributing in the development of calcium-related disorders and abiotic stress-related disorders in Apple, along with development strategies to mitigate those problems. Our webinar today will start with Dr. Giverson Mubampi, who will provide us information about what is a dendrometer, the type of dendrometers, and some examples of how we can use the dendrometers in the tree fruit crops. Later, Dr. Kazost will continue providing examples of how we can use the dendrometers in the tree fruit crops here in Washington State. After that, we will have a questions and answers session where we will try to answer all the questions that you are putting in the box. After that, we will continue with the survey. So you can provide us information about needs and also feedback of how we can improve the quality of these webinars. For the persons that will see the recorded version of this webinar, I will encourage you to please email me with feedback for topics that you are interested to know more about related with the tree fruit physiology, as well as a provider as feedback from the quality of this webinar. With nothing else to say, I will leave you with Dr. Giverson. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar. I think we all agree that irrigation management is becoming really important uh, in apple production. I think we are all faced with conditions where we have really high uh, water deficit conditions because of high, high temperatures and we're also sometimes faced with water restrictions. So finding ways of managing irrigation in a way that's responsive to the tree is a role that can be done with the use of dendrometers. Um, 10 minutes is not enough time to cover all the dendrometers do, but I'm hoping to hit all the high points to give us a, a, some of the highlights so that we can start a discussion into how we can use this instrument um, as a method for irrigation management in apple production. So basically an, a dendrometer is like an automated caliper. So this is an instrument that you can use to measure the dynamics of stem and fruit. And the dendrometer, the good thing about the dendrometer is that it is connected to a data logger. So once you have it connected to a data logger, you are able to monitor it online, which makes it a very good if, uh, tool for growers in terms of them being able to see what's happening um, on the conditions on the farm. So when you look at a dendrometer, you actually get uh, two kind of readings that you under, can understand long-term growth conditions, or you can understand the response to water stress. So if you look at the graph that I have, um, that, that we have, we have two trees 
And then as you can see, when you stop the irrigation, the stress plant, like the long-term growth of the stress plant starts to decline. So just by being monitoring this, so this, if this were two dendrometers that you had in your orchard, you'd know that maybe if this tree is in a certain block, you might want to look at that block and see if there are conditions, uh, so if there are problems with the irrigation system. So this is a tool that's really uh, useful for growers. So I think dendrometers, they work by usually by through the transpiration process. So at night, uh, when the stomata are closed on a tree, so when the stomata are closed, the tree is going to take up water from the, from the it's going to take up water from the soil. And this, because there's no transpiration or carrying, the water is stored inside the tree and usually the stem expands. So you have your maximum stem expansion uh, in the morning uh, before sunrise. And then during the day, as soon as the light comes out, um, your stomata are going to open, you're going to have leaf gas exchange and you start losing water and then your stem is starting to contract. And the contraction of the stem is supposed to be related to the evaporative demand. So if you have high evaporative demand or if you have a high stress conditions, then your stem is going to shrink more, which is going to be an indicator for you maybe to start irrigating. The other thing is fruits may also shrink by water loss, but in April, the skin surface is not really conducive because we have a waxy layer. Maybe when the fruit is young and it's got stomata, you've got more water loss, but as the fruit is maturing more, then the water loss uh, from the fruit is really negligible. So this limits uh, the use of fruit as an indicator of stress. So I think this brings us to the next um, slide where we're trying to see. So when you're looking at a uh, dendrometer, you can either put your dendrometer on the stem or you can put it on the fruit. But most of the research has found that the trunk diameter is the most sensitive indicator of the irrigation because than the fruit. There are several factors that are sort of disqualify using the fruit. One of the main things uh, is with fruit is that the xylem, which is the main path through which you transport water becomes dysfunctional as the fruit matures. So this has the potential to sort of the signal that you get from the expansion of the fruit can become less as the xylem functionally declines. So this makes it a not a nice method to measure stress. But so this is an example of uh, that's the xylem decline in fruit. When you look at Granny Smith and Braeburn, it's like 67 and 64 days after fruit bloom respectively. So the fruit that's got more dye, it shows that this, the xylem is still more functional compared to the fruit that is less dye. And if you use these two fruits to measure with a dendrometer, you might get different expansion rates, not because there's differences in water movement, just, just because the xylem functionality in one fruit is less than the xylem functionality in the other fruit. The other thing that disqualified fruits uh, when you use fruit as, um, for, to measure stress is that when the fruit is growing, especially during the active growth period, the expansion of the fruit might be too big. So each gauge that you get, each dendrometer has got an expansion range. And when you expand beyond this expansion range, actually your graph could potentially flatten off. So when you look at this flatten off, you could think that's stress, but actually it's just the fruit having gone beyond the expansion range. So if you're using fruit for water stress, then you have to be constantly changing your dendrometers. You have to be constantly adjust, adjusting your dendrometers uh, during the season. So this makes them maybe a bit more tedious to use compared to the stem, which might not grow by that, by that much. Um, one thing that we haven't really looked in, because I was looking into the data for dendrometers, is um, the differences between cultivar. I think we know from previous research, uh, this is a model that I did with Lee Kausitz at the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center, that there's differences in stomatal conductance and leaf gas exchange between cultivars under transient water stress. So these measurements were taken on a day with high evaporative demand uh, at 98 degrees Fahrenheit and BPD of 3.71. As you can see, uh, Granny Smith kept its stomata open. So by keeping its stomata open, it, it adjusted its stem water potential and the lower stem water potential. Potentially, this could also be transferable to the stem where the, one, the cultivar that is called the stomata that are more open is going to, uh, to have a more shrinkage compared to the cultivar that doesn't have the stomata open. Uh, there isn't much information available on this, but this could be one of the considerations that you make when you're trying to use dendrometers, that the information that you might be getting from different cultivars might have different meanings just because 
of the behavior of that cultivar under water stress. And this is related to what we call isohydric or anisohydric behavior of the plants where they respond differently in terms of the stomata closing under water stress. So when you look at the data that's collected by dendrometer, if you look more closely at it, what you have is you've got what you call your maximum stem diameter, which is usually occurring uh, just before dawn, when the, the tree has had the, uh, the chance to take up water during the night, you have what you call the maximum stem diameter. You also have the minimum stem diameter that occurs usually late in the day when you have, after you, your tree has reached its peak as stress in terms of evaporative demand. And then one of the most important indices that you get is what's called the maximum daily shrinkage or MDS. So that is the maximum stem diameter on that day minus the minimum stem diameter. So that daily shrinkage is usually what's used as an indicator of stress. Like if you have a higher maximum daily shrinkage, then it's usually an indication of stress within the tree. Um, you also have the daily recovery where you look at the maximum stem diameter on, the day, on that day minus the minimum stem diameter on the previous day. And then you have also the daily growth rate, which is just you subtracting the maximum stem diameter from that day, and then you subtract it from the minimum stem diameter. But with all these measurements, what we really want, um, what we're really concerned with is the maximum daily shrinkage and um, the stem growth rate, which is the rate at which the stem grows. So for young trees, uh, and in periods with rap rapid stem growth, the stem growth rate usually is a much better indication uh, than the maximum daily shrinkage because the stem growth rate is actually going to show you the differences in the stress between the trees. You can see that this young tree is performing better because it's able to grow more compared to the other tree. But when you reach now to a mature tree, when the tree is, for example, after maybe fifth leaf, fifth leaf in a high density orchard when you don't have much growth, then your stem growth rate becomes negligible. Then now you need to use the maximum daily shrinkage as that now becomes a maximum, that now becomes a better indicator of water stress. So in terms of you using a dendrometer, you have to understand the phenology of the tree in terms of using these indices as a way of indicating water stress and then having using them to automate your irrigation system. You need to be able to understand where your system, uh, where, sorry, where your phenological stage is in terms of the growth of the tree. So just to give a more example, just to explain this, um, this is some pre previous research that was done. So this is a 10 year old golden delicious on M106. So basically this tree has stopped growing. What they found was that due to the low growth rate of the trunk, and the high variability also, the stem growth rate wasn't an ad adequate indicator of stress. So the, since the stem is not growing, you can't really use it as an indicator of stress. But however, what they show that maximum, maximum uh, shrinkage, the maximum shrinkage rate, maximum diameter shrinkage was a better indicator of stress. Although it was less sensitive to water stress than your midday stem water potential and your pre so stem water potential, this uh, maximum diameter shrinkage uh, could be related very well with uh, evapotranspiration and midday uh, stem water potential. So this makes it a good parameter in terms of if you have that automated within your orchard, then you can use it instead of going out and having to do like midday stem water potential rating in terms of you being able to schedule your irrigation. Um, this is another study that was done with a 21-year-old golden delicious tree. What they found in this study was that the maximum, the, the daily shrinkage rate increased at the beginning, then decreased as the season pro progressed. So I think Lee is going to talk about this later, but this um, in this is changes, I mean, with, depending with phenological stages. So in terms of if you're using this index as a way of um, scheduling your irrigation, you need to understand at what phenological stage that you are. You can't have, for example, you say if it's 0 0.5 micrometers, this is minimum, minimum, minimum stress or what. You need to be understanding uh, the phenological stage at which you are so that you can use this index as a way of scheduling stress. And then the relationship between uh, the daily shrinkage and meteorological bias is very was found to be significant except for bud development and flowering stage. I mean, this makes sense because at this stage, usually your canopy structure is not fully developed. So 
your, your leaves, which acts as an extra storage of water for your stem to expand, might not be, might not be there. So having the phenological data, having the indices as a phenological data is really important in order for you to be able to use your dendrometer to uh, schedule this irrigation. Um, if you look at the type of dendrometers, there are two uh, categories that you have. So you have uh, contact dendrometers and non-contact dendrometers. Uh, for this webinar, we're just focusing on the contact dendrometers. And then the contact dendrometers that you have, they can be classified into two main types. So you usually you have your point type uh, dendrometers and you also have your band types dendrometers. So your band type dendrometers are usually made of stainless steel. So you have a stainless steel band that's wound around your, uh, your, the circumference of your trunk. And these usually they provide a better estimation of the changes in the diameter because you've got more points that are in contact uh, with the trunk diameter. So what you normally have is you have this metal spring on your mat on the bed, on the steel band that you have, and then this spring is going to expand and contract with the tree, and then that signal is going to be sent as a voltage reading to the to your data logger, which then changes it into actual uh, diameter changes. So, but with this thing, there could be errors, especially when, um, when installing the, the metal band. So there could be errors associated with that. And also since this uh, band is made of metal, metal is supposed to expand when it's heated. So the data that you have is supposed to be adjusted for the error that you get from the actual expansion of the gauge itself due to the heat, not to the expansion of the, of the trunk itself. So you should be careful with this data when you to make sure that you've adjusted for the expansion of the gate of the band itself because it's made of metal metal material. And then if you look at the point type dendrometers, these are dendrometers that usually measure changes at single points along the tree. So this is a point type, type dendrometer that's connected uh, to a fruit. So you've got those two points, which is the two radii. And the point type dendrometers, like I said, they're usually easier to do in stems because of the expansion, the stems usually are not growing much, but if you do them sometimes in fruit, as you can see, this dendrometer is almost extended beyond its expansion range, which means that sometimes the values that you get, you have to be really careful in terms of making sure that the gauge is reading within the expansion rate of the stem that you're reading or within the expansion rate of the fruit that you're reading. That you're reading. So I think I mean, there is a lot that could not be covered within the 10 minutes, but these are some of the readings that I can recommend, especially if you are interested in using dendrometers uh, as a method of uh, scheduling your irrigation. Um, these are really useful materials to read so that you can find what are the pitfalls or how you can use uh, this technology. I will send this, um, these references to Jenny as well, and then she can share them with you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, these are my contact details. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. And if you want to discuss more about how you can use this technology as a management for irrigation. Uh, thank you. So thank you so much, givers. So, and so now because of time constraints, so we will go straight to uh, Lee and then with the session of uh, questions. Go ahead, Lee. I'm just gonna kind of carry on where, where Giverson left off to give a really good background on the science of dendrometers and where they've, you know, some of the results that have been that have been published in the past. So my first experience working with these was uh, was actually this this spring um, with the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission funded sensor orchard down in Pasco, um, Phytech, which is a, a company that that um, uh, has these and, and a platform for making irrigation decisions, they installed these sensors, um, both fruit dendrometers and stem, stem dendrometers in this, this sensor orchard. So this is the kind of the first year working with them. Um, and and you know, we've installed them in a couple other places and I've seen them, some, them in commercial orchards um, within the state as well this year. Uh, you know, some of the advantages, or one of the, one of the big advantages of this is that it's a plant-based indicator of water stress. So, Unlike soil moisture sensors, which only indicate what's going on in the soil, um, these plant-based indicators, they integrate soil moisture, um, they integrate rootstock water uptake. 
they integrate psi and conductance and also the environment that those trees are living within and kind of integrate all that into to one type of signal. So similar to stem water potential that, that um, uh, Giverson uh, kind of showed those comparisons between stem water potential and, and uh, um, these, these dendrometers. And you know, that's one of the advantages of having something that's plant-based. Um, some of these, these newer um, dendrometers that are coming out, um, different companies manufacture them. Um, they have app-based platforms and remote connectivity that make it easy for the grower to access the data and make decisions based on that. I think some of the disadvantages is that you know, it hasn't been used extensively in Apple um, from on a production standpoint because of the, the limitations in, in integrating the signals to an actual practice. So, um, you know, it's relatively young in the sense that there's new platforms being developed that are available now that are much more user friendly than they were traditionally in the past, even though this has been used from a research standpoint for, for quite a while. I think one of the other things that is that, you know, fruit growth curves are different for each cultivar. And, and it's really important when you're using the fruit dendrometers, which measures fruit growth over time, that those growth curves are extremely accurate and, and reflective of the orchard that they're growing in. Because fruit growth curves are gonna be different depending on rootstock, um, the environment they grow in, and a whole bunch of other factors. So having really good fruit growth curves and, and the factors that affect those growth curves outside of just irrigation alone is important to consider in, in kind of developing this as a technology for the growers to adopt. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with this is the placement of sensors. Um, it's critical um, where, you, where you place the sensors and what fruit you're selecting or what trees you're selecting is really important. They need to be representative of, of that orchard as best as possible. And that, you know, that's a kind of a common theme for all sensors, not just, not just these dendrometers, but sensor placement is, is critical when you're trying to make irrigation or management decisions based on those. And you know, one thing that I've seen over the last little bit, or the last season, is that the MDS, or the maximum daily shrinkage, seems to be affected by a whole lot of different factors that could be independent of plant water status. So water status is one of them, but you need to account for those other factors as well. So this would be kind of a common output. So this is actually from a, a dwarfing rootstock. So you, then this is the, the stem dendrometer sensor. So this would be how it would be installed normally on the right. This would be the trunk. The, the sensor would screw into the trunk, so it would be mounted or, or anchored into the trunk. And then it has this spring-loaded point dendrometer here that measures really small fluctuations in, in uh, trunk diameter. So on the bottom, I have an example of this, a two inch diameter trunk or five centimeters. And a, a kind of a, a low amount of daily shrinkage would be 50 to 100 microns. And that'd be this greens part on the right. And kind of a high end of shrinkage would be 200 microns or this red spot on the left. So you're looking at really small amounts of trunk shrinkage relative to the overall. So you're not visibly able to see this, but this point dendrometer being as sensitive as it is can pick up on those really small variations. So in this particular orchard, this snapshot, this was um, uh, August 10th to 16th, so last week. We can see that the fluctuations or the MDS values were ranging from 118 to 159 or 167. This is on one of the hottest days. So those ranges, that's, that's in microns, so really small fluctuations in, in trunk diameter. And you can see that the, the stem growth curve is relatively flat. So this is a ultra dwarfing rootstock where the wood growth would be very, very slow, or if at all, um, these trees are probably approaching the biggest they'll get. Um, so we're not really expecting any net growth in stem diameter. So we'd expect this, growth, this curve to be fairly flat. If it were a younger orchard, we would expect this, the, 
the day-to-day -day variation to be more or less positive or if it was early in the spring when wood growth or early summer when wood growth is occurring but right now in August we're not getting much um, stem, stem growth at all. So this would be kind of a common output we would see for, for the, the point dendrometer. For the fruit sensor, so it's a it's kind of a, a clip. I think Giverson showed showed another model where it, it, it clips around and sprinkle out a clip around around the fruit and it measures fruit diameter change over time. And here you can see the daily change. And these numbers on the bottom represent the output of the stem or fruit growth over time. So now we're getting into a phase later in the season where fruit growth is, is fairly, fairly slow. It's starting to slow down. We're averaging about 0.2 millimeters per day in this orchard. So fruit growth is getting near, near maturity and it's, it's slowing down a little bit. A month ago, it would have been more like half a millimeter per day. Um, this black line represents the modeled fruit growth curve um, for, for Honeycrisp on this output um, but you know that's going to be very variable by by the type of orchard it's in soil type or or the environment the microenvironment that it's in um, one thing is that this is just showing the field to field variability so this is the output from last week from two different orchards it's really the same environmental conditions but really two completely different orchards the first one was this this bud nine orchard orchard one with bud nine as a rootstock? And you can see there's no no net stem growth. And the one on the right is a regraft Honeycrisp orchard. So they're both Honeycrisp. Um, this is M9 and it's a regraft. So there's a lot more vigor in the, those trees. And but they were planted the same year. Or sorry, the orchard two is a regraft in 2016. Orchard one was planted in 2016. But orchard two, where there's more vigor and there's still a lot of growth, we can see that there's a net positive stem growth over time. And the MDS values, maximum daily shrinkage, are relatively small compared to the other orchard. So accounting for those orchard to orchard differences, and, and you know, this one's not showing much stress, um, but the fruit growth rates are, I mean, they're a little bit, a little bit more, the fruit is overall a little bit bigger. So you can see that, that these MDS values on average, they're a lot smaller and fruit growth rates are, are faster and, and the fruit's larger in this orchard. So you can sort of get to, get to see how, how some of the, the factors involved in this, these trunk variations might translate to differences in fruit growth. Um, one of the things we've noticed is that while there's a, a depression in trunk diameter, during the day, and that's typical. During during midday, the, you get a, a de or a shrinkage, but in the fruit, we see this this increase. And and talking to Giverson, we think that you know that might be due to expansion of the material itself of those sensors, but that might be something that we'll need to look at or address in the future, is whether these these daily fluctuations are actual fluctuations in the fruit or whether it's, it's a, a sensor related issue, something to work out in the future. But in fruit generally, it's the, it's the, the growth value that is most important. Because once you have these curves, then you try and match what your, your forecasted or your target curve you want, what your target fruit size you want at the end. So you try and match your fruit growth to meet that curve. It just kind of gives you a, a moving target to adjust your irrigation to as, as the season progresses. So I kind of just, some of these, these issues that, that may need to be addressed as this technology gets more adopted um, in Washington State. Um, again, looking at that, that diameter gain in fruit or fruit growth during the day, um, is that, is that a, a sensor issue or is it actual true fruit increase, uh, something to look at. Um, developing better thresholds that are adaptable to specific goals a grower wants to achieve. So you might get a, a yellow indicator indicating that there's some sort of water stress, but maybe in one variety or for your purposes, that's not actually a yellow, maybe that's a green. Um, and developing 
those those thresholds and and kind of fine tuning those uh, for for specific goals would be would be useful. Um, looking at the role of EC, so we're we're doing some work with that this year. Um, how evaporative cooling affects these MDS values, so irrigation onto the trunk um, and water can be absorbed into the trunk, and how that affects the daily shrinkage. And and we're gonna we're gonna pull some data from from one of our research orchards that that has that has those sensors installed to kind of look at some of this issue. And then really to get into some of the orchard factors to make sure you're you're placing the sensor in the right place to understand all the other factors outside of water that are affecting these MDS values and fruit growth. And these are just some examples. And kind of try to understand some of these factors a little bit better for Apple in Washington state as these, these sensors get adopted. So um, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and then we can go on to Q and A. Okay. Thank you so much Lee, for, uh, for the talk. So before coming from the, for the Q&A, I had a comment from um, Professor Stefano Musaki that he's mentioning that in Europe, it's at least 15 years that growers are using dendrometers. Um, I just want to comment that um, that is good information. Um, I think that this webinar is also addressing that um, it is just starting to use the dendrometers here and it is good that we are starting this conversation here in Washington. So this is a good idea to keep in mind for future webinars. And with that, I would like to uh, continue with the questions. And the first questions, the first two questions start for Giverson. The first one is that uh, when you say a stem, are you referring to the trunk, not to the fruit pedicel? Yes, to the trunk, but sometimes you can only use it on the smaller stems as well within. So if you have the older trees, you can try to look for the smaller stems within, like the smaller branches as well. But it's not the pedicel. I'm not referring to the fruit pedicel. Thank you. Mm. Uh, a question from Ines. Would you suspect that MDS is still the best indicator when using very dwarfing rootstocks? Yes, I think I would say it's the best indicator, but like I said, um, you were looking at that indicator at the phenology, maybe when that graphing rootstock has stopped growing, so maybe is it in the fifth leaf or sixth leaf, but if still it's in the first leaf or the second leaf, I would suggest you using the stem growth rate because that stem might still be expanding. That would be a much better indication of, so it goes back to how if the stem is still, stem is still expanding, then you can use the MDS or not, or you can use the stem growth rate. But at the end of, if it's not no, no longer expanding, then you can use the MDS as a better indication because you don't have any growth, you just have the daily contraction that you see as an indicator of stress. Does timing of irrigation impact MDS? I, um, I would think so. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen any studies, but I would think so because if you have, um, for example, if you irrigate at night, then you're most likely to have a higher maximum stem diameter because you're able to take up more water. So that could impact the MDS, so definitely so. But I haven't seen any studies that look at the timing of irrigation. There's no studies that indicate that. So for Lee, in the orchard one and two slide, what is the blue lines above the sun and temperature colors? Yeah, so um, yeah, Garrett, that, that indicates um, irrigation events. So this, this platform also has um, irrigation monitoring um, sensors that they have pressure sensors installed in irrigation lines that can track irrigation events. With, ha with honey crisp, we deliberately keep the tree under stress most of the year. What measurement from the dendrometer would you use to tell when stress is okay versus too much? Yeah, that's, that's one of the, the I, I think probably um, questions that need to be addressed. Um, I don't think those thresholds are are probably clearly developed for for Honeycrisp at this point in time. Um, so I wouldn't be able I wouldn't be able to give you a specific value. But they can range from you know I've seen in Honeycrisp under a fairly um, I would say stressed Honeycrisp uh, above 200 and and then as low as 50. So it can range a lot 
but I think those thresholds need to be more clearly defined. This is, this is a question that I think any of you two can uh, ask, can answer. It is about if uh, there's dendrometers that can be used for sweet cherries. I mean, uh, dendrometers can be used on ev anything. I mean, as long as you've got stem expansion, you can use them, but you might need like sweet cherry might uh, behave differently to echo. So you might need to have different values for your MDS but they've been used on uh, olives, they've been used on citrus, so you can basically use them on any expanding stem. Okay, well, I have a question regarding that. So, um, so the dendrometers, when you would choose a dendrometer for your crop, you you have to find the one that it is set for the fruit, for, for example, apples, or there's a dendrometer that it is specific for pears? I think, what you'd like to look for is the size for your, for your dendrometers. So if you look, for example, for Dynamax, they will sell you different sizes of dendrometers. And if you have maybe your smaller dwarfing root stocks, you're gonna look at the smaller sizes of the dendrometers. But if you have a really old, old orchard with really big trunks, then you wanna look at the bigger size of the dendrometers. And these dendrometers, some of them can be used on both uh, tr small trunks and on the fruit. So you just need to know the size of the way you intend to install your dendrometers then you buy something in that range. Then you also have to take um, the expansion range for something. So the expansion range for a dendrometer that you're going to use, for example, on a sweet cherry is going to be different than the one that you're going to use like on an apple fruit, which is going to grow much bigger. Thank you. If the growers are interested in um, using the sensors, the dendrometers in the orchard is, uh, when to put the sensors, when to put the dendrometer if I want, if I will be a grower, when I will be, I will need to put the dendrometer in my orchard. And uh, what is the height that I will have to put, to put it in the stem? So in terms of when to put the dendrometers, I think, for example, I think I showed a slide where they found that the dendrometer wasn't, uh, wasn't the maximum daily shrinkage was not really sensitive during a uh, bloom or during uh, flowering. So maybe during periods without the flowers. So maybe when you have your fully developed canopy, that's when you should put your, your dendrometers. But then sometimes the maximum daily shrinkage uh, also changes at the end of the season when your leaves are falling. But by that time, maybe you've harvested your fruit. So just a matter of understanding the conditions where you are. I mean, this, I think with this technology, there need to be some experimentation that needs to go on. In terms of the height, I think I was talking with Lee yesterday because I think Lee, we mentioned that sometimes you get expansion uh, of the bucket. So of course the bucket is hygroscopic, which means it uh, um, absorbs water. So if you are using an impact spr sprinkler, sometimes your back may absorb some of that water and cause the dendrometer to expand. So if you're using something like that, <laughs> Maybe you might want to make sure that your dendrometer is not summer where it gets too wet. But maybe if you have like a drip irrigation, I think you can put them anyway. But which brings out something uh, very important because I haven't seen any data that compares a dendrometer that's been in, in, uh, installed maybe on the rootstock compared to the scion. So maybe we don't know that that information is not available. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe you guys could do some of the research on that to see if there's different in expansion rate. Maybe even the dwarfing root stocks are going to expand differently. We don't know that information. Yeah, there was a there was a paper that was published well quite a long time ago when they first started working with the dendrometer. I think it was in the early 2000s that uh, looked at the positioning in the tree and didn't really find too much of an effect as long as it's installed in the main trunk, and that's for the the stem or the trunk dendrometer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the, the water, water contact points would be important to, to consider. Okay, there are two questions uh, for Lee. Can fruit dendrometers damage fruit? How often do you have to adapt them in apples? Yeah, so, and I think actually the, the second question too, they can both be answered in the same one, is that, and this goes back to Giverson's um, point where the range of movement for the dendrometer needs to be adjusted, and, and that can change um, as the fruit those, they, they may need to be adjusted or moved around if the fruit stops growing. If it's, if it's under the dendrometer for too long or it's under tension too long, it might affect the, the growth. So there has to be some, some monitoring of, of kind of abnormal behavior and, and adjusting on the, on the go. And I think um, you'd, you'd hopefully get that with, with um, the, the services that are available. 
um, using this technology. So yeah, it, it needs to be it needs to be to be watched by someone who can spot those abnormalities. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Giverson. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. It was really nice to have you here. Thank you, Pat. And thank you everybody for attending this webinar. It is 2.45 and the webinar is over. However, if you have more questions related with this topic or if you want to provide us feedback with more topics for more webinars about technology, as well as uh, to improve the quality of our webinars, please don't hesitate to contact me to the email provided below at j.bolivarmedina at wsu.edu. Thank you, uh, have a good day and see you next time, bye.